Hi, and welcome to Windy Videos. This video is of our vacation from Paris to Normandy on the Avalon cruise ship, the Tapestry 2. And we really hope you'll enjoy sharing our vacation. So our journey begins where the boat was docked on the Seine River. You could see the Statue of Liberty and the Eiffel Tower right from the boat. Later on in the video, when we get back, they light this all up at night. It's spectacular. But for right now, the first part of our journey is we're going to head up the Seine through the main part of Paris and under all these low bridges. Now, underneath all of these low bridges, you can't go on the top deck of the boat, just like on other cruises, that, river cruises that we've been on. We've been on four so far in Europe, and they are wonderful. There's just no substitute in my book for a river cruise, and Karen and I both like Avalon the best. We've been on other ones. There was a hot air balloon right by the dock where the boat is, and as we were leaving this area, we found out a lot of interesting things about the way this is set up in France. They allow people to live on barges on both sides of the Seine. Some of the people, these are the people that back of our boat, some of the people that live on these boats, they're usually barge owners, or you can see they've customized them. We at one time had a similar thing in New York City on the Hudson River, and I think they outlawed it, I'm not sure. But from where we were, you could see the modern part of the city, but we were more interested in the older part of the city. Later on in the video, we're going to see the real heart of Paris, and it was spectacular. The guys had the, we had the chance to get to know some of the people on the boat. And as always, you're very easy to make new friends. There were people from New Zealand, from Canada, from Australia, all over Europe. It was just a wonderful crew. The crew couldn't have been better. The people that were serving food, we actually got to know a few of them, Katarina. And uh, the food, if you like good, high-quality food, and there's not much better than what you get on a riverboat cruise. Every one of the meals we had was really delicious. So the first part of our journey, the first stop off was Claude Monet's Magnificent Giverney. Hope I'm saying that right. The French seem to say it just a little different. We went through a few of the more populated villages to get to where this location for these gardens is. They're world famous. It's one of the most visited sites in France. It is absolutely spectacular to see it and you can't see any part of it from the road. There's high hedges built all around it. It's very secluded and private. You go through some beautiful countryside to get there. This is the actually the the street that you walk down to get there. Very, very old village, very quaint. And then to actually see the gardens themselves. Now, for Karen, this was a very special thing because she was an art student for maybe 20 years. She painted some of Monet's, copies of Monet's paintings. She loved them. We have them hanging in our home. One of the pictures she loves is Monet's, the water lilies, the bridge that goes over the water lily pond, and do, there's the bridge. And we got to get a picture of her standing on the bridge that Monet actually painted. And this was a, one of the high points of our visit to France. Now, if you look real close, you can see he's painted bamboo here. There's another part of it that you don't really see here, is how many individual flowers are growing here and how manicured it is and how clean it is and how well maintained it is. Now I have a very small pond and believe me the maintenance on a pond is a lot more than you think it is if you don't have a pond but the water lilies the every part of this is just spectacular and and I can see why it's so popular it takes a couple of hours to walk through this and Go, you actually go around an island. The middle of this is an island. Some of these flowers I did I was not familiar with. Some of them I, I was familiar with. Karen knew a lot about it. She was telling me a lot about the whole thing with Monet. His life. He was married twice. And there, there's a lot of 
stories and things. There's the bridge in the background. But his big thing was he liked to go out to his gardens and paint, among other things. And there's, there's the overview of how big this is. And we were only in one part of it here. But it's, it, it just, when you see this in real life, it's one of the things I think, if you see it in real life, you can't believe how beautiful it is and how well-maintained it is and how old it is and how it has really stood the test of time. And I always think one of the things like this to leave as a, le as a legacy, if you had this garden and nobody maintained it after you passed away, what a sin that would be to, to that other people would not get to enjoy it. We got to see it. We got to enjoy it. I got to videotape it so you can enjoy it. Hopefully you're enjoying uh, my little presentation here and sharing our river cruises and our vacations on YouTube is one of the things I personally enjoy, but I enjoy just walking around here. I could have spent or literally spent the whole day here. This is such an unusual, spectacular scene and it's so well maintained. I just go, as a, even as I'm looking at this video and editing it, it's just so unique. I don't know how they actually do it. There are chickens on the property. Claude Manet raised chickens. This is in his little museum that's actually on the property. You get to walk through it. Some of the little artifacts, the furniture that was in his house, it's all well maintained. Here's an overview from up at one of the, the windows out, the little museum that's there. And every part of it is just interesting to me. Every part of it, it's the furniture, all of the little things here's the uh, the fireplace it's all original it's all so nice there are books available Karen already has these books believe it or not and for us this was one of the real highlights there's Claude right there so I had to get a little cameo appearance like in an Alfred Hitchcock movie here and this little town was just spectacular we love old houses. We, of course, live in an old house, so we, we don't have much of a choice. But it was time to get back to the boat, have some lunch. And, of course, by the time you get back to the boat, they have lunch prepared for you. All kinds of little delicacies, all kind of breads and different things. They actually had frog legs. I wasn't that keen on the frog legs, but Karen had them and said they taste like frog legs. I had the chicken and said it tastes like chicken. So I don't know. Anyway, I'm being on the top deck of the boat on a day like today and just watching a river go by. It's absolutely spectacular when the weather is beautiful. Both sides of the rivers, we were taking pictures of the swans. We have swans by us, but they were beautiful. They just, they seem to stay on the edge of the river as you go by. Of course, there are many, many other boats, these boats. They're called river boats, and you can guess why. They're long and narrow. You pass some of the churches, all of these old churches. Now, we found out another thing, that the country of France maintains a lot of these old monuments and churches, but the sad thing is only about 10% of the people in France use the, the churches. So, And here's the, the barges going by, and the people keep a car on the back of the barge. I thought that was just, just as cool as could be. More swans everywhere. Swans, swans, and more swans. <laughs> that's funny. And of course, just sitting back and watching the world go by, that's what river cruising is all about. You're the one driving the boat, right? Yeah. Oh, he's driving from here. He promises only to have one drink at lunchtime, not more than one. And we're coming up on a lock here. Obviously a man of high skill. He won't let me drive the boat. <laughs> it's pretty cool they have a life-size chest, a human-sized chest set here. Very cool. What a beautiful day this is. Holy mackerel. Just beautiful.
Check that out. That is pretty impressive, I have to admit. Stronghold. This beautiful fortress that was built under the decision of Richard the Lionheart. Norman. We. Oui. Right. Richard the Lionheart or the Lionhearted. Depending where you come from. In England they say hearted and they say good no, sorry, that was able to resist the siege of two years. I'm a nice person. I've got the picture to show you what how it looked like. It looked like. You see it from the side. It is not the main view you've got here. Oh, wow. You've got it just from the side. Another map with me. Oh, my little At that moment, Richard was so powerful that look at that. This is France at the time of Richard. All what you've got in red, very small part. Here is in the surrounding. People started to make a joke. They say it is not the king of France, it is the king of a French island. Do you know where you've been? Yes, is it? But instead of being dressed like a normal knight, he dressed like the king he was. And he was the fortress. And over 97, when they started it, after seven years, it was called They are seven. And they are seven. across a village called Tuk. So when you go on a tour to Paris and it turns into a dog Eagle. show. Uh, that's my labradoodle. Oh my god. <laughs> Who's got the most dogs at this table? <laughs> you got more dogs. Uh, what the fuck are you? Oh, Sorry. I'll edit what that kind? out. What kind? No, I won't. Well, you're not sure. Oh, oh, are you <laughs> A horse is a horse, of course. Horse, of course. And There's no one in the dog. Horse, ah! horse. That's my, this is my, um, that's my Arabian. That is, she's not very... Do you live on a farm? Mm -hmm. Wow. This is the next day on the tour. We're going to be going to see some abbeys today, and it is, uh, as opposed to yesterday, it was 97. Today it's cold. You almost need a coat. And it just looks like another, another beautiful blue skies day. Uh, on the way up to where we're going to see the churches and the abbey, the, we passed something that I thought was spectacular. They had a seaplane, a 1930s seaplane, that was uh, heroes that try to rescue some explorers that were up by the South Pole. They tried to rescue them and they lost their lives. And they made a monument to these people by carving that seaplane into a mountain. I got pictures of it later to show. It's gigantic, it's a seaplane coming out of a mountain. And of course the big bridge, and this is a modern bridge of course, but these old abbeys and old churches where we're gonna be going, they, they have to be seen. Now this church, I guess is not even a fair thing to call it a church. I don't know what the right word is, whether it's an abbey or a church or both. But from the, from the street and as you walk in, 
you think, oh, that's nice, but nothing spectacular. But as you walk in, you see it's all hidden from the street, and it's enormous, and it's the ruins from centuries ago. And as I'm looking at some of the parts of this, even looking at it now, and I didn't see it <clears throat> the first time in real life, it has stood the test of time. Now, the history of these buildings it would be way too long for this video, but you can see the ruins that some of them, they've stood the test of time. And even through bombings and through fires and some of the, 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 the church itself had no roof. And can you imagine? There's just some history here. It's just hard to believe that that's stood the test of time through the ages. Now, I thought we had seen it all. But as you walk through, you realize you've only seen a little part of it. There's a whole, another whole layer of this. It's like peeling away an onion. And there's, now you th I think to myself, how did they even build this? The guide says some of the rocks on this were 6,000 pounds. The, the stones that they used to make this on the upper level. And the upper level was really high in the towers. And I was thinking, boy, that's, that's a feat unto itself. Not only, not only do you have to carve the stones, none of the stuff was mass produced. It's all done by hand. How do you get the stones up to the top level? Well, that, it's like building the pyramids of Egypt. And then when you think about it, there's something that's sad as can be. All the work that went into this church was in a time when almost everybody went to church. Now, this is kind of like only about, again, I've the number that we heard was 10 to 11 percent of the people in France go to church on a regular basis. Well, that that just seems sad in a way. And to think that these are little by little going to deteriorate. Now, they're not going to last forever. And I think like this one here, it's actually dangerous standing under these. You, you think, boy, oh boy. Now, there was some damage from bombs on World War II. And it's it's a very long, intricate story. But I just thought looking up at it, you can't, you don't really get the, the feeling when you're seeing it on a video as you do when it's in real life of how old it is and how big it is and how heavy some of these stones must be. And, and each one of them had to be carved by hand. It wasn't like you just go to Home Depot and buy a, a bucket load of these things, every one. Now, they said another thing that I thought was interesting is some of the churches in the area when the churches got old or they got bombed, they repurposed the stones and built other churches. They, they had recycling down years ago. And just looking around at this, and it was a foggy, wet day here, and it was eerie to, to let's look at this and know how old some of this stuff is and how big it is and how did they make it. The top of that tower, Karen was impressed, I was impressed, but now we're going to go off to an abbey and meet, it's an active abbey. Welcome by the community and the Father of God, community of the 28 months we are usually here. We are on the traces of Gandhi, who has founded this monastery in the 7th century. We are on the steps of Gandhi, who founded this monastery in the 7th century. Gandhi. <laughs>
So on the way back to the boat, I asked the bus driver to drive slow past this. Look how this is, this monument. It's just spectacular to see that in real life. It's coming right out of the side of the, uh, looks like it's carved into the mountain or somehow made out of cement. I don't know. It's, it's very big and it looks, it's exactly a replication of the plane that was sent to the, uh, the North Pole. So sitting on the back of the boat here, I'm trying to figure out what they do up here. Looks like they're restoring a wood boat. Not sure. So this is what they do when they have, they have two boats docked side by side and then a, an ocean liner going through. Pretty cool. One with the water yeah, bottle. Yeah. Okay. Right. Take, Thank you. Just small, they can just go there. And okay. Get away. Idealized landed in Normandy and not Pas de Calais. Huh? Maybe some of you know that the Germans were waiting for landing nearby Calais. So why finally Normandy was chosen? How did they plan everything? All the schedule of 6th of June 1944 D-Day. And uh, of course, make a little sum up quickly of the men's step of World War II. Well, you've been to the lecture yesterday. Did you like it? Was Nigel? So you learned a lot of things. Abbey Church, where Queen Matilda, his wife, is buried. So, on the right hand side, but problems to see it. When you will look on your right hand side, you will see in the distance the sea. And you will see a part of a little floating war, a floating wharf. Oh, no, a little bit. So Omaha is down there. And you will see a museum just on your right hand side where you've got cannons. You will see some of the German obstacles. And you've got, you know, especially one thing. This is thick. That's why you've got a huge mine. Do you see it here on my right hand side? That were the kind of mines that were put in the oceans. You know, and and if you pay attention to your right, you've got a Sherman tank, and then you've got kind of pyramids made with concrete. Do you see that? There were anti-tank obstacles. Now, this exact part of our tour was very emotional for Karen because her father was involved in the D-Day landing at Omaha Beach, and. Uh, to her, it was very emotional to be at the exact spot where he was in the time of the Normandy invasion, which Omaha Beach was one of the five beaches. Now, they purposely left the guide. I, I'm over, overstepping her voice here because the, the area is still full of the debris, the bunkers, some of the original cannons, big giant holes in the ground from bombings. And you can imagine on D-Day, if you've ever seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, how chaotic this must have been. And some of these bunkers, they were built by slave labor, and many of the people died actually making them. They were worked like slaves. The barbed wire is still in places. And the bunkers where the soldiers, that down there, that's a bunker, an underground bunker where the Germans were living. You imagine what life conditions must have been like uh, under these conditions, that is Omaha Beach right there. That is the the place where Karen's dad s served out some of his military service. Uh, luckily lived to tell about it too. And we were looking at how rough this area is. Imagine soldiers coming through this area and bombs going off and uh, just just unbelievable. Just an unbelievable sight to see it all in real life. And note it, that is the exact spot. This is not like a movie recreation of it. So we walked down there, and we were very interested in spending some time there. Look at the big bomb craters that are still there. 
A lot of them are quadrant off with wire. It's a, it's a place in the Normandy area. The area that this is in is a beautiful area. It's a farm area. Look at that. To climb up those cliffs, just think of it. Just think. And I, to climb up those cliffs right now might be a problem. It definitely would be a problem. But this was a very emotional thing for, well, for both of us because I'm, I'm a believer that the people that did these things and saved us from the Germans, they owe, we owe them an awful lot of respect. And the memorials they built to them, that when we go from here, we're going to go to the, um, the place where they're buried in the cemetery. It's a wonderful, beautiful place. Everybody that was there, and there is the beach. Imagine coming up on that beach and how... The Germans had the high ground and were shooting down at you and the bombs were going off. And Normandy Hall is our countryside. There's hate as you see here. Look to your left. Look how it is. Uh, 82nd never had cricket. It was given the 101st. But, it's a yeah. <laughs> um, when the guys were... Join us today to remember this very special event that uh, committed our world and to, to stay. Mm.
inside the dead calm area, that shelter. There were passengers for the ship to enter, to drop it between two, and from the point two, there were those floating wharves reaching the shore. Have you seen how narrow they are? They were used only to unload one way. On the ship to the shore was the slaughter, where the guys had to go straight ahead, rush forward, and exit by out. Because landing was just the very first step. At the end, they had to make their way up, control the brotherhood, wings and hold them, wings of freedom. No one free moment of the battle. It was for the 60 years of freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, from now it's free time. And uh, we will... You've got another shipping tank. The tank hedgehog just in front of the tank. Look very carefully. And inside the museum, you've got a landing car vehicle and person all with a jeep that exit from that pinging boat. Pinging boat. And the check and uh, the Belgian gate. Thank you with the traffic, especially on the ring road of Caen. We didn't be just lucky. We've been smart because we took the right side of the ring road. The other one was overcrowded. So, thanks to our driver, Jean. Hey. Good job. Yours. No, yours. Well, that would be very nice. You know, that would be very pretty. Yeah, your oh, look, just over there. You got to Kudebeck. So I, I know, and today there were no shops at all. Um, some of you find something in the in the gift shop of the golf uh, course restaurant. But tomorrow, uh, I will not be with you. I'm sorry. It's my slap. So after that great trip to the Normandy beaches, we'll be having us a, a cappuccino right by the room. Oh boy, what a beautiful day this turned out to be. Wow, and the boat's getting ready to depart in about 15 minutes. Just in time to have a nice cappuccino. Now we passed this memorial again on the way back, and I, I just keep thinking how impressive that is, however they did it. And I wanted to see it as the ship left, and you could see it. We were far from shore here. We're actually on the other side of the river. But you can see how just coming by in a boat, you can actually see that. I try to get it from a couple of different angles. And to me, this was a, a special little thing, a special little bonus. And I'm going to have to look up the history of this, the uh, mission that they were on when they obviously, they lost their lives. So the next thing we were going to see, and this is in a beautiful part of the village that still has a lot of the old construction. There are a lot of things to see here. And... The, I'm amazed at how good the guides are, the local guides. They have the history of almost every building, every little nuance. And this, you go around the corner. You don't see this from where the ship is. You go around the corner. You walk up two blocks, and there's the most ornate church I think I have ever seen. And I've seen some pretty elaborate churches all over the world. The one in Canada and Quebec that I thought was pretty ornate. And some of the other ones, they're just, this one was right up there with the spires and the towers and the carvings. And it's right in the middle of the old section of the city. Absolutely everything here. It, when you think of a movie set for a movie set in this time, they could use this church and there's no way you could fake that. Look at the carvings and on the, when I think about it, back in the day, there must have been millions of people that were stonemasons. And because they're working on a church, maybe a lot of them had a, look how one side is different than the other. There's then this, I think, and I might be wrong about this, but I think this is one of the buildings. They said that it took, the, some of the building was built in one century and some was, some was built in another century. And you could see where one, one style of construction ended and another style began. And there were just several little things that, that they told us in the abbey, the abbey we visited on a previous day. They, the artisans made every window in the church totally different. There were no two the same. And I look at some of these carvings and some of these gargoyles. And when you see this stuff in real life now, 
you just can't imagine how many man hours went into this and how big it is here i wanted to get this from several different angles because the churches old churches you can imagine again there was there was a time and in humankind when pretty much everybody went to church one way or the other but nowadays it's 10 percent and and but these churches they're deteriorating and i i don't know if uh you know how long they can last with the, the amount of money they put into restoring these buildings. And I know the guide had told us several times in the past, some of the people in France are not in favor of restoring these churches. They're, they're not religious people, but my God, to lose something like this. And imagine, just a look at this and imagine the man hours. And how did they get all the carvings and the paintings on the ceiling and on the God, anybody that's ever worked on a house, you know what a job it is to get up on a roof of your house with a ladder. Imagine, you're not carrying a 6,000-pound block of stone either. Just amazing. Now, the stained glass windows are a whole thing I, I have done as a hobby when I was much younger. I made some stained glass lamps. And it was a labor of love, and I know how long it takes to make just one little one little lamp and these windows these windows are 30 feet high and those domes and those circles and no two are even close to being the same and the next thing we were going to see after this was a church with even more ornate windows <laughs> Now, the outside facades of some of these buildings in the town on our way to the church with the really enormous windows, this clock, I had seen one like this, I think it was in Austria, and see those holes in the bottom of the clock? They're actually windows. And this is a little bit like there's a little area here, a little picnic area as we're walking down through town, little souvenir shops, and the town kind of changes into a little more modern in this, this part. But there is this church, and they said the church is designed to look like a dragon. Well, I don't know. It, it was totally different in the inside. From the outside, you'd have no clue what was inside. And you had to wait a while to get in there. There were tour groups going in and out. And once we got inside, I understood why. And you can see how what pride the people take in their buildings and there's flowers everywhere. It's just a beautiful country. It's a beautiful place. And this is the old, supposedly the oldest inn in France. And uh, the guy told us that might be debatable. But look at some of the windows. This is what's inside the Dragon Church. And you don't realize the, the height of these windows. Look at the windows. Hey, go make something out of stained glass and see how long it takes to make a, a tiny little piece. And they're detailed, every detail. And you can see there's parts of them. You, you, really, you really can't see it in a video here. Parts had been restored. Parts had been replaced. Some of these, some of these buildings had damage from World War II. Some didn't. Sometimes the bombs landed near the building. But anyway, I thought that was just a great little tour. And then this was really fun. We get back on the boat. We're getting ready to have our uh, our meal, and we stumbled upon some kids on the shoreline. And I, I egged these kids on. It was pretty funny. Come on! Jump, you're a coward! Oh, push him in! Push him in! And one of the things I love about river cruising as a way of vacationing, you unload your suitcase once, and for however long the cruise is, you get plenty of hours to just watch the boat go by. The boats don't go fast, they cruise, you can sit out on a deck. It's just like riding a motorcycle. Look at these rock formations. It looks like they've taken things out, like a heart shape. I don't know if you can see it. That's amazing. Here we are just cruising, cruising, and more cruising. So the next stop we're going to make on this tour, we were going to go to the home of Josephine and Napoleon. 
And it's some wonderful story, uh, the history of Josephine and Napoleon, and it's long. And I don't have time for that kind of a, a story now, but just to sum it up, it seems like uh, Napoleon didn't like the house as much as Josephine, and she bought it without telling him. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Karen kind of smiled at that. And anyway, he was off to war, or doing something, who knows what these people do, when they're away with no internet. And she wound up buying this house anyway, and he did, really didn't like it. He said it was too small. It didn't reflect his true power in the world. Well, mm, I don't know if my house reflects my true power in the world either. But anyway, it was a beautiful home, and it's got beautiful artwork everywhere and period piece things. The furniture is absolutely gorgeous, the chandeliers and everything. But the story of Napoleon and Josephine, I... I wouldn't even get into it here, but it is a wonderful story. Karen was so intrigued, and she's a World War II buff more than anything. She's decided she's going to read up on it, and uh, she, it really piqued her interest. What their relationship was like, and the fact that she was buying houses, and every time he'd go away for some kind of a trip, she'd redecorate the house. Apparently, she had the checkbook if there was such a thing back in the day. And you can see on the floor here, as I walk through the rooms, how, how different the decorations are here. And there's, there's one thing I noticed right away, that if you look at the grounds, out the windows, beautifully maintained, everything, everything is beautiful. It's crazy. Beautiful. Eh, that tiger, I don't know if he's so beautiful. They made a rug out of a tiger. This table was really ornate really super ornate not even ornate super ornate just look at some of the, the carvings and the gold and everything and of course he had one thing which i guess every important person has a lot of pictures of him hanging all over the all over the house what am i talking about i have pictures hanging all over the house but look at on the floor it is he's the these these pictures are gigantic by the way they're eight ten feet tall and josephine never would be a portrait made of her where she had her mouth open because supposedly her teeth were terrible so i guess the uh, dentistry back in the day was not what it is now maybe you had to have teeth made out of wood or something i don't know but beautiful furniture and all of these places are totally totally restored next stop versailles This is the actual translation of my name, Guinevere, so we will come to use the English version during this afternoon, and of course use it at... Now when you actually get to Versailles, it's overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. And the first thing the guide told us is that, for obviously this is a high level tourist uh, attraction, to be careful of pickpockets, and so we were really on our guard. But we did have a, quite a few places, but they said France, you, you don't have problems with violent crime, but they pick your pocket. I don't know. I guess that's nonviolent crime. I was looking at the gold leaf that all these gilded gold things, the fence around Versailles was go, gilded with gold. The guide told me it's real gold too. So I don't know. You know, I've done gold leaf work on model airplanes and lettering and things like that but i had never seen this much gold leaf the only place i've ever seen this much gold was in st petersburg and some of the, the castles that were like this had the domes and the onions gold plated i call it plated it's really the right word is gilded but all throughout versailles there is plenty of gold if you like gold they did a fence the fences around there's a mile of a mile of gold fence. Can you imagine how many hours it took to gild that? Look at, and everywhere. Now, when you walk in, it's strange how to have it laid out. You have to walk upstairs and then around and then go downstairs and upstairs to go downstairs. And it, it's really not laid out like uh, for a fire escape. That's for sure. Anyway, if you like gold, if you like 
paintings like the Sistine Chapel. Holy mackerel, everything is ornate. Not one single square inch is not ornate. It's hard even to see some of it. You hurt your neck bending up. Obviously, labor was not a problem or gold when you did this kind of work. And I think it's a, it's a pretty good, I guess, uh, you can think of it this way. It's a pretty good reason they had the French Revolution. <laughs> The, the poor people got sick of seeing all this gold and they had nothing to eat. So maybe there's a lesson there for all of us. Should share the wealth a little bit. But, and everything that isn't gold is marble or carved or it's just really an amazing place. Now, the hermitage has got a lot of artwork and things in it that are really ornate. And some of the castles in Russia were very ornate and very gold plated. But this is I think even at a higher level, the, the, the furniture, some of the furniture was gold plated. So can you imagine when you have millions of people starving and all you're worried about is get some more gold leaf on that railing? I don't know. You, that's probably why they had the revolution. So, and of course there's stained glass windows, arches on everything. Everything has, they were restoring parts of it. It's enormous. It's it's like one football field of stuff after another. The gardens take you a whole day. We didn't go through the gardens, but you could see them out the window. It'd take you a whole day just to do the gardens. And there's no way you could see the rooms. There must be a thousand rooms in this place. And every one of them is different. Everyone is gilded. Look at all the, the chandeliers and just absolutely unbelievable experience to see this in real life. Here's a chair that was, I asked the guide, what are the chairs made out of? She said they were made out of bronze. And then, of course, what else? Gilded with gold, everything gold. Now, as I looked at some of the furniture here, and again, this is really modest to me. Karen and I, when we bought our house, we bought a bunch of old furniture and restored it. And it took a lot of time and effort to do a lot of the work and some of it was gold leaf and a lot of it she actually took a furniture refinishing class this stuff would blow you away though chandeliers chandeliers in every room can you imagine though how much how much hand labor went into every single part of this every part every corner every piece of molding there's nothing there's nothing that isn't ornate i it's, it's absolutely amazing just like the Taj Mahal, I guess. But I guess there was a, a motive to this. If you wanted to keep everybody in your kingdom starving while you ate and got fat and had heart attacks, this is what had to happen. I, what else could you spend the money on back in the day? I mean, you couldn't buy a Range Rover or, or whatever or jump on a plane and go fly to America. So I guess gold leafing things was the only thing left to do or these art, I don't even know how you could paint that. It's hard enough. Anybody that's an artist knows. Karen's an artist. She went and took lessons. And you get a headache looking at the people. When you're sitting facing an easel in a nice comfortable chair, it's hard to paint. Imagine this. Imagine carving all those corners and edges. And holy mackerel. I, I was amazed. Now, I know people that don't share my uh, appreciation of craftsmanship might not understand why I found this to be overwhelming. And this isn't even the fancy part of the palace. Now, there's gardens for acres and acres and acres of gardens. We, we're only getting a tiny view of it. And, of course, a lot of it's under restoration, as is pretty much everything in France. Everywhere we went, they're restoring things. So they, they are proud of their heritage, and God bless them for it. Look at how ornate this stuff is. Holy mackerel. I, from my point of view... This, now that I have seen this in real life, it's off my bucket list. I'm happy to share it. And I'm my motive for always shooting a lot of video and pictures, because a lot of my friends never get to see this in real life. But the second best thing is if you can see it this way. And actually, if you can see this in 4K on a big TV, boy, are you lucky. <laughs> I watch my YouTube on a big screen TV, so, and I, I can dial it up to 4K, but even on a phone, this must look good. Now, this is the, the coup d'etat here is the Hall of Mirrors. So you have to go past this landscape and a couple more bedrooms and these, these rooms that are gold-plated and have 
diamond doorknobs and everything, but the ponds that and they only they only run the uh, the pumps. I think they said only on weekends. I think this was a Sunday, but again, I was lost in a time warp here, and this is just one of the the pieces of headboard that I unbelievable. gigantic Eiffel Tower uh, constructed to tell the whole world that and I thank the Lord that Simon is writing and not me when we go to that square because I would never ever dare go in here the rules are very very chaotic if you look underneath the arch you can see flowers and a big flame on the ground and these mark the location of the uh, grave of the unknown soldier and that was a soldier who remained unidentified after World War One and was it was decided to bury him here to represent all the lost lives of that terrible war and so to this day we still have that flame on top of the tomb and we um, we rekindle the flame every single night at 6.30 during a little ceremony <coughs> and many associations of soldiers, active or veterans, French or foreign and that can include also firefighters, em emergency response teams so we have a broad understanding of the military <coughs> here you can, uh, if you belong to one of these uh, corps, you can it's a very very good thing that we decided on never forgetting how bad it had been and um, on our, the armistice day on the 11th of November the French president lays down flowers in the name of a nation here 
And the same thing goes for World War II armistice on the 8th of May. And the Arch of Triumph itself, because it was not completed in the lifetime <coughs> of Napoleon, now bears also symbols of the French Republic. For instance, you can see this is the larger square of Paris. It, it was created in the 18th century by King. So the color there is beautiful, amazing, that light, beige, wonderful. And then look at, look to the left and the difference of colors. There's a big artistic installation by a street artist, JR. It's just his initial, JR. And it looks like the facade of the opera house has sort of exploded and instead of looking inside the opera house you are suddenly into a <coughs> large cave so it's quite fascinating and um, it JR was given that opportunity because there are actual scaffolding behind the fake scaffolding we are in the process of cleaning down the facade of the opera house and we thought that since we were going to have big ugly scaffolding, we might as well turn it into an artwork. I must say, this is really, really nice. I'm glad you are here to see that because there would big billboard popping up everywhere in town. To your right, there are the Galerie Lafayette. So if you want to come back to that area, this is the in but here, if it happens on a bridge, it's the bridge that comes down into the Seine River, which means that the city of Paris is one bridge short. So a lot of trouble. So they decided on changing that. And this was one of the stops we made in central, the middle of Paris. There's this beautiful park and just manicured. You can see how beautiful it is. The flowers are blooming, beautiful buildings all around. And every, I guess the equivalent would be Central Park in uh, New York City, or a lot of uh, many cities have a park like this. Statues everywhere, and you can see the Eiffel Tower off in the background. Everything about it was reminiscent of a big city, including the pigeons, people feeding the pigeons, people walking around, people, a lot of women pushing young children in baby carriages very reminiscent of I guess most modern big cities because there's there's part of Paris that's a modern city and part of it the old city and we were more interested in the old city we really didn't get to see much of the newer modern city but this park was really nice there were young people exercising and everywhere you go people are riding bicycles and doing these things and uh, just reminiscent of Central Park in New York City if you've ever been there but really, really, and this was a beautiful day, by the way. Long building that you can see across the river is the Louvre. Oh. All of building on the other side. So now you've seen two sides of the U, that is basically the shape of bows, are stored away and always invisible to the public. We do have rotation inside it. We built the bridge. Uh, that you see to the right as well with its amazing gilded statue on top of columns and uh, this is the friendship between France and Russia in 1900. Things are looking a little bit different now in 2023. And now we're driving towards the Invalids. Mm. Now we saved the uh, Eiffel Tower for one of the last stops on the trip. You could see it from where the boat was docked. It didn't really look that big when you get really close to it and look up at it. It's unbelievable. It's It really is a work of art. I, I was so impressed. And later on in the video, you'll see it lit up at night. That was, that was pretty much how we ended this journey. What a way to end the journey. If there ever was a, uh, put the exclamation point on a sentence. Anyway, we had a nice, really nice little uh, lunch on a bar, on the top deck of the, the bar that's on the top deck of the boat. I went over to see the balloon that this, they give rides on a balloon. And our friends, Gary and Cheryl, who 
we spent a lot of time with. We were talking about building bridges, so he's a bridge engineer. I went to see that train bridge, which looked pretty unique. And I wanted to take one final picture of the boat while I still had daylight, because the rest of this time we'd have would be at night. I explored the area outside of where the, the, uh, the boat is docked. And it was really pretty cool. You can see there's bicycles out of view here. It is a, a motorcycle parking lot you can park. People commuting to the big part, I guess the business part of Paris. But we wanted to see everything at night and that was gonna be spectacular. So as we finished up our time in Paris and after dark, this just got more spectacular than you could ever imagine. It was just a beautiful thing to see Paris on the river at night, all lit up. The sights, the sounds, just amazing. And before I end this video, I want to thank our good friend Rick at Artist Travel for setting up this whole trip. It was flawless. It was just as good as it could get. And I want to thank my friend Najat who steered me toward getting this 4K camera that I hope uh, you'll be able to play some of the video or all of it in full 4K. Paris is a very, very special place and I wouldn't even put a put it beyond our uh, bucket list that maybe we'll be back and just spend a whole tour in Paris. This is just a spectacular city. It's great to see on a riverboat. I just can't even, at this point in the trip, I was still blown away and these scenes were going over and over of my head as we ended the video. So if you enjoyed the video, thank you guys one and all so much for watching. And we have other videos on our channel. Most of them are related to motorcycling, but there are a few travel ones and some that might interest you. Search around on the channel. And again, thanks for watching.